we're here now on lecture 11 to talk about some of the major struggles in Africa after nations got their freedoms. We already had the lecture on nations getting their freedoms. Now we're gonna talk about three independent African countries that had really serious problems after independence. We're gonna talk about South Africa, Rwanda, and Sudan. So first let's talk about South Africa. South Africa got their independence from Britain in 1910. South Africa was one of the places that lots and lots and lots of white Europeans had moved to because they really liked it. The climate there is cool, uh, cool as in nice. Uh, they liked it. About 20% of all South Africans, so 20% of the population was white. And 80%, of course, me was black. This 20% controlled everything. All the bosses, all the owners of the good land, all the government workers, the president, everybody. Anyone that was in a power position in South Africa was white. They made these awful rules about Black people, what Black people could do, what Black people couldn't do. And in 1948, they made this law called apartheid. And apartheid means separation. It was separation of the races. And everyone in South Africa was labeled by your race. There were white, black, colored, and Asian. Now, remember, I in the United States, in the United States, this term colored is racist. Don't call anyone colored. It's really, really racist. Well, in South Africa, it's different. In South Africa, colored means mixed race. Like maybe your mom was black and your dad was white or uh, vice versa. If you're a mixed race person, you're colored. So in South Africa, they say colored and it's perfectly fine. In the United States, if you say colored, somebody might punch you in the face, so don't say it. All right, so everyone had their label. That was your official, like I have my uh, AIS official work badge it would have my, uh, my registration, what race I am, right here on it. And you had to carry your badge with you at all times. Black people were treated like foreigners in their own country. They had to have permission to leave their neighborhood. Like if a black person wanted to leave their neighborhood that they lived in, they had to have permission. There were segregated, that means separated, segregated restaurants, segregated schools, segregated beaches. Uh, they got lower pay for the same thing. Like I'm a white woman. If there were a black woman teaching in the classroom right next to me and she were teaching the same class, world history, I would make more money than her simply because I'm white and she's black. And uh, black people were forbidden to own land. And their schools were horrible. So once again, Segregated restaurants, segregated schools, lower pay for black people. They weren't allowed to own land. 
they had to have permission to leave their neighborhood because all the black people lived in one neighborhood and all the white people lived in another neighborhood. And if a black person wanted to leave the black neighborhood, they had to have like a permission slip to do that. They were forbidden to own land. If you went to the beach, there was the white people beach and the black people beach. And in opposition to this, rose up a political party called the African National Congress. Now they couldn't really do anything. They couldn't, they didn't have any real governmental power because black people weren't allowed to be in the government, but it was still a, a group of people uh, that were fighting apartheid. They had protests in the streets. They would have sponsored strikes from their job. They would do boycotts. So protests, strikes. We talked about strikes before. You should remember what a strike is. And a boycott is when you refuse to buy from a company. Let's say, um, uh, I don't know, let's say Coca-Cola. Let's say the Coca-Cola company refuses to hire black people. And so a, a boycott would be when a huge group of people refuses to buy any Coca-Cola products, they're boycotting them, trying to, uh, because companies need customers. So if their customers go away, then they might change. It's a powerful way to make companies change their policies is through boycott. In 1960, the African National Congress had a peaceful protest in the streets of a town called Sharpville, Sharpsville. And in, no, sorry, no S, Sharpville. In Sharpville and in this peaceful protest, 69 people were killed by the police. Think back on this class. We've learned before about a peaceful protest where the police turned on the people, right? Do you remember that? I hope you do. It's important because history repeats itself. You see the same stories over and over and over again in different regions of the world. So when we're talking about this peaceful protest in Sharpville in South Africa, you should be thinking about Russia. Okay, now, um, when that happened, when the police turned and shot, killed innocent peaceful protesters, some people from the African National Congress gave up being peaceful. And they said, being peaceful is not making a difference for us anymore. We have to turn to violence. That's what these people listen to is violence. So we have to fight violence with violence. <clears throat> there was one really famous ANC leader, African National Congress leader, and his name was Nelson Mandela. And when all of this like craziness started happening, there was violence, violence in the streets, the ANC against the white government. When that happened, they um, started, this guy Nelson Mandela, he went underground. By underground, I don't literally mean he went to live in a cave under the ground. Underground means you go, uh, go 
out of the public eye. Nobody knows where you are anymore. And, um, but in the, and he was one of the leaders. He was one of the leaders and he started living kind of secretly so that the government couldn't find him. Well, in the 1960s, he was found and arrested. He was tried for treason. Treason is to go against the government. So he was found, he was arrested, he was tried for treason, he was found guilty, and he was imprisoned for life. Well, this, of course, made the ANC even stronger. People are, people are more angry now. They're mad. Their leader has been imprisoned for life. And in 1984, suddenly the whole world started looking at South Africa and thinking, eh, this really isn't cool. You guys shouldn't be doing that. And lots of Western countries started putting economic sanctions on them. Economic sanctions, it kind of limits trade. It makes it harder for South Africa to be a prosperous nation because <clears throat> some Western nations are refusing to trade with him. And there was another leader, another ANC leader named Desmond Tutu. He was a priest, a Catholic priest. And you know what? Ooh, I might be wrong about that. He might not have been a Catholic priest. I'm sorry, I can't remember right this second. He was a religious leader, I'm gonna say that. He was a religious leader and he won, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize. He was given the Nobel Peace Prize for his non-violent opposition to apartheid. In 1990, finally, the president of South Africa, F. W. de Klerk, ended apartheid. He ended apartheid and he released Nelson Mandela from prison. In 1994, for the very first time ever, Black people were allowed to vote. For the first time ever, Black people were allowed to vote and they elected Nelson Mandela as their president. So 1994, Nelson Mandela, who had been leading this group for black rights in South Africa since the 1960s. In 1994, he was elected president. There are still problems in South Africa today, most of the money is still with the white people. Most of the bosses at jobs are still white people. White schools are still better. There, there are problems, but they're slowly working on changing things and making it better. So that's all about South Africa and apartheid. Uh-oh. I didn't mean to close that. Okay, now we're moving on to Rwanda. 
you know what? I didn't show you guys the map. Sorry. Africa map. Should have done that already. Okay, so here's Africa. South Africa is this country at the very, very bottom. This is South Africa. And Rwanda is a teeny, teeny, tiny, little bitty country right here. I'm gonna go back, look. Look at how teeny tiny it is. Rwanda, that's Rwanda. And the one below it is Burundi. So we've got, oops. This one on the top is Rwanda. And the one on the bottom is Burundi. And we're about to talk about Rwanda. I will at one point, I'll, I'll mention Burundi, but we're mostly talking about Rwanda here. Okay, so in Rwanda, there are two main ethnic groups. The majority of the people are Hutus. That's a U, Hutus. The minority of the people are Tutsis. These are the two main ethnic groups in Rwanda, Hutus and Tutsis. But even though the Tutsis are the minority, they're the smaller group, they controlled everything. There was some ethnic violence over this. Of course, the Hutus thought they should be in charge because they were the majority. So there was some ethnic violence between these two groups. Then in early 1994, there was a mysterious plane crash. Nobody, they, they didn't know why the plane crashed. And the plane happens to have the president of Rwanda on the airplane and the president of Burundi. So both presidents of these nations died in this mysterious plane crash. Well, when that happened, uh, extremist Hutus, extremist Hutus started urging their neighbors to kill Tutsis. And they did. People went out and literally just killed their next door neighbors. People, all of the Hutus went out on the streets and started randomly killing Tutsis. At least, at least 800,000 Tutsis were killed. I'm gonna go back to the map. Look at how tiny, tiny, tiny that country is. It's teeny tiny. And at least 800,000 people were killed in that country because of ethnic violence. The world ignored it. These people were slaughtering their neighbors. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. In 1994, a Tutsi exile army, exile, that means Tutsis, 
that had fled the country so they wouldn't get killed and made an army, came back into Rwanda and they conquered the Hutus that were attacking them and uh, took over the country. And they set up a government And this government was supposed to be based on equality. They wanted to share the government between the Hutus and the Tutsis, no more minority rule. The leaders of the, uh, the leaders of the genocide you guys know what genocide is, right? It's an ethnic cleansing. We talked about this before. Genocide is killing people of one, one ethnicity. The leaders of this were eventually taken to the world court and uh, accused and faced trial. But overall, mostly the world just ignored it. And why is that? Why, why would they ignore something so horrible? Uh, well, um, you know, there's no oil in Rwanda. There's no money for anybody in Rwanda. And it was just a bunch of poor Africans killing a bunch of other poor Africans and other people in the world just didn't care. It's really, really depressing. Please, I hope if you can learn from me from teaching you this class, please learn to care about other people. Okay, and now we're finished with Rwanda. Now we're moving on to Sudan. Let me open up the map, show you where, here's Sudan, here. Now, today, there's Sudan and South Sudan. But at the time of history that I'm talking about right now, all of this was one country, Sudan. I'm actually about to talk to you about the creation of South Sudan, but we're talking about Sudan right now. Okay, let's go back to that map actually. In the north, most of the people that live up here are Arab Muslims. So this is totally a Muslim dominated area. And, but down here in the South, these people are not Muslims. And these guys up here tried to enforce Sharia law on the South. Well, the South wasn't having that. They're like, uh-uh, I am not going to live my life based on your religious rules. That is not happening. And there was a civil war, the North against the South. In 2005, there was a, the government, the official Sudanese government, which was in the North, came to a peace agreement with the rebels from the South yeah, that was in, they came to a peace, peace agreement. And so, um, yeah, they made peace. Let me erase some of this because I have to show you where the fighting was really, really bad. Not uh, Darfur, um, that's not what I meant. Yes, Darfur, 
this is what I meant. Here in the west, it's weird. I don't know why it's not just showing me. Okay, well, whatever. The worst of the worst of the worst of the fighting was in the West. Over here. This region is called Darfur. And um, they, people from the North were really, really awful to the people down here. They went in and they just burned down and killed entire villages. Entire villages of people down here were just gone. Uh, they also ran people off their land. They said the, the, people, the people that survived had to leave. Eventually, the United Nations did send in peacekeeping troops, but they didn't really help much. And in, but in 2009, some of the leaders from the North that were doing this slaughter in Darfur they were brought to the international court and charged for uh, crimes against humanity. In fact, the president, the president of Sudan was, was charged in the international court with crimes against humanity. I am giving you an assignment right now. I am not going to talk about this assignment in class and I don't want you to mention this assignment in class. I'm giving it to know who's watching my lecture and who's not. I want you to look up crimes against humanity and write me a little essay about what what are crimes against humanity what does that mean you can do anywhere from three to five paragraphs if it's something that's especially interesting to you you can write me a three-page essay i'm fine with that but if you just turn in a few sentences to me, I'm not gonna give you credit. I want you to really give me a good essay about crimes against humanity and tell me what that is. And we're all finished. That was lecture 11. Okay. <laughs>